I just want to start um, by talking a little bit about the problem that I want to address um, today. So I'm obviously talking about pathways to integration. I want to talk a little bit about what I think the obstacles might be that we might want to address. And just to begin with an observation about the understanding of what those obstacles are that's made in a lot of the global justice, global democracy. Uh, and that's an idea that the key problem is uh, that we have a lot of power being exercised at the global level beyond the level of nation states, uh, which is unrepresentative, which is unaccountable, um, uh, and which needs to be tamed. So it's this problem of, of taming power and the impetus then for uh, trying to build uh, institutions that are more just, institutions that are more democratic, is to properly tame um, and make more just, to moralise the power uh, that's already been created. And I think that's um, obviously an incredibly important problem and there are very good reasons why that's been a preoccupation in a lot of this uh, justice and democracy literature. So I'm obviously going to look at my, some of my previous work. So, um, but what I wanted to talk about today was a, a different kind of problem, which is I think also uh, one that also needs to be tackled as part of this global integration agenda and also as a precondition for um, global justice and democracy agendas. Uh, and that's the problem of creating more effective institutional capability. You want me to slide? So send your, slide? Send your yourself slide? in the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so the, the, the basic um, starting point then, I guess, is to say uh, that one of the key obstacles, I think, to uh, many of the kinds of moral agendas that... that uh, talked about in this literature and uh, whether whether that moral agenda be a fairly minimalist one like trying to limit violence and promote some kind of international order peace and security or whether it's a much more comprehensive moral agenda that's trying to foster some kind of uh, you know, liberal legitimacy or some egalitarian conception of justice for example no matter what the content uh, of that moral agenda um, seems everyone it seems clearly the case that we currently lack um, institutions that have the capability to advance those agendas. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that I think um, there is a second dimension to this problem um, of uh, pathways to integration, which is sometimes um, neglected in these, not always, but somewhat neglected in these literatures, uh, which is not the problem of taming power, but rather the problem um, of constituting um, power, that is of creating institutional um, capacity. Uh, it seems to me that this is one, in fact, one of two um, key central uh, traditional theory problems within um, classical political theory. Obviously this problem um, of um, taming power, of um, ensuring that the exercise of power is justifiable for those who are coerced or those who are affected by it. That's obviously one central problem. But the other central problem is linked more, I think, to uh, social contract theory, but to, to this idea of a collective action problem. Uh, being at the heart of uh, the kind of political problem that we want normative theories of political life to address and to offer us some kind of prescription, some kind of remedies, um, some kind of guidance as to how we can try to overcome um, these problems. So that's that's the problem that I want to talk a little bit about today and to, and to have a think about what some of these um, theories of democracy and justice have had to say about that problem, that other dimension of the um, integration problem. Uh, and then to sketch very briefly a, a framework for thinking about global legitimacy as opposed to global dem democracy as a theoretical framework for trying to tackle that problem systematically. Uh, so to begin then by saying a little bit about how I think uh, established theories of justice and democracy have come at this, this problem of creating institutional capacity. Uh, and I think you can draw, there are some common themes. Um, there are two main kinds of stories that literatures have told about how this, this institutional capability can be created and sustained. Uh, and the first one is a, is a commitment to the transformative power of moral advocacy. So the idea being that um, the key obstacle to the creation of the kinds of institutional capabilities we need, whether we think about them as taking the form of a world state, as we talked about this morning, or whether we think about them taking the form of some different kind of um, governance apparatus, 
the key obstacle is that we're not sufficiently morally committed. Either that we don't all agree on what the right ideal is that we should be working towards, or that we all understand what justice is, but we're too self-interested or otherwise not sufficiently motivated, not sufficiently morally motivated to act on. So the idea underlying that is if we just have to get, um, we just have to get the arguments right, we have to do the advocacy right, uh, uh, and then everyone will get on board. You know, and these moral motivations will steer us um, in the direction of, of institutional integration. Um, now, while I certainly think that that kind of moral argumentation is normal fierce, I of course think that moral argumentation advocacy plays an important role in any kind of um, project of political uh, reform and transformation. I think it's a little uh, naive and optimistic to think that that alone is going to. I think most people in the room would agree with that. I don't think I need to make um, uh, uh, too much of a case for that. Um, and I think that the problems, the obstacles there, again, are well understood. There's plenty of, plenty of um, work on this. Obviously, the problem of moral disagreement um, is, is pervasive. Uh, it's not one that I think we're going to resolve just through um, you know, good philosophical <laughs> reasoning. Uh, and also, I think, the second point that I think perhaps needs a little bit more to be said about it is that this question of moral motivation um, is one that is intimately bound up with this problem of uh, creating institutional capacity. And this is, again, this is an old point. So, <laughs> um, of course, made this point that uh, you know, a commitment to the right kinds of moral principles is, is not one that exists um, independently of an institutional order. but uh, we, in fact, need to be embedded already in a certain kind of institutional order in order to have the kinds of moral commitments that are required to sustain that institutional order. That's a sociological point, but it's one that's very well understood and widely accepted in principle, uh, which creates a problem, I think, for this. We'll get there through moral advocacy view. Um, the problem is it points us to a second kind of logic or a second kind of story about how uh, institutional transformation can come about, and this is one uh, the two, two examples, I mean, you know, that Rawls obviously in his story about the source of, of the stability of a, of a liberal institutional order. Uh, Robert Gooden has something similar in his, uh, his historical picture of how global democracy comes about, this idea of um, falling in a hole. You know, we're sort of wander we're wandering around historically and we chance upon uh, this democratic arrangement and then once we have it, it turns out no one wants to go of it. So, um, and, and I think the, the essence of this kind of story about how institutional transformation comes about is it's a story about historical opportunism, that uh, circumstance will present us with a morally desirable institutional arrangement, and our job is just to recognise it as desirable and kind of lock it down to make sure that we build into our institutional structure the right forms of social education and we socialise people into the values of the system and so on. This is very much the story that Rawls obviously tells about the emergence of the liberal state. Um, you know, first through modus vivendi, through the uh, balance of interests, and then um, through the kind of socialization into the liberal democratic values that provide the source of stability for that institutional system. So I think these are the two key stories that recur in a lot of the literature. Um, uh, either we, we get the moral arguments right and reform follows, or we just have to wait for historical opportunity to present itself um, and then pounce. Yeah. So, um, and I suppose what I want to suggest is that the first of these is too optimistic about the, the capacity of moral argumentation to bring about change, and the second too pessimistic, because uh, I think there is an important role for value-driven um, transformation. We need to have some shared understanding of what the values are we're trying to build in order even to be able to recognise uh, a desirable institutional arrangement when it presents itself, uh, and to share a commitment to then trying to secure and stabilise that institutional arrangement. So, uh, the form that the problem takes then, or the form that the solution to this collective action problem uh, needs to take, um, is we need to have a, uh, a set of values or set of shared understandings and forms of reasoning about what makes an institution um, appealing and worthy of support, uh, which doesn't depend either on moral um, agreement, agreement on moral principles, which we don't have and are likely never to achieve. Um, which also doesn't depend on any kind of uh, moral motivations which um, are not going to be achievable prior to the existence of the institutional order itself. That is, it doesn't require socialisation into the institutions to sustain it. Um, uh, so it has to be, 
motivationally realistic, but it also has to have some kind of um, normative substance so that uh, it's not it's not purely based on an idea of uh, might is right, the idea that um, uh, we can uh, achieve coordination and solve collective action problems um, through just a balance of power, um, which is obviously uh, the modus vivendi story. Um, and what I want to suggest is that this is the problem um, that we face, and a solution to this problem, or a, an, a, a systematic method for tackling this problem and trying to develop prescriptive standards and principles, uh, can be found in the theory of, of political legitimacy as, as distinct from the theory of justice. Uh, now, the problem with this, obviously, is that the theory of legitimacy is, uh, the concept of legitimacy is extremely contested. It's put to all kinds of different uses, sociological uses, moral uses. It's been um, you know, co-opted, obviously, in the liberal literature to, to mean that the right to rule so it's got a very specialised use, which is really internal to a moral theory of justice. Uh, and it's very difficult to talk about this concept without everyone um, you know, going off down their own little rabbit holes. Um, I think there's been a useful intervention into this conversation um, by Alan Buchanan and Robert Coheim, the work that they've done on global institutional legitimacy, uh, which linked the concept directly to those who aren't familiar, I assume some people here are familiar, but not everybody, uh, which linked the idea of legitimacy directly to uh, the solution of a, a certain kind of institutional collective action problem. And, um, my view is that that's the right approach, that's the right general approach, that it's very helpful to uh, link the idea of legitimacy to uh, this collective action problem because it gives us a language and a conceptual vocabulary for tackling this somewhat neglected problem of how we can solve this collective action problem to build institutions um, uh, as a foundation for whatever kind of broader moral agenda we want to pursue. Uh, so th the next thing that I want to do in the time I have left, how long do I have left? You have another oh, 10 minutes. Another 10 minutes. So what I want to do in that 10 minutes is to talk a little bit uh, about, uh, first of all, how we can do a little bit more work in diagnosing the nature of that problem, um, and then secondly, to talk about uh, what sorts of principles and institutional prescriptions would follow um, as a solution, and thereby to set us on this kind of... Uh, pathway towards greater global integration of the kind uh, that we um, are looking for. So the first thing then is to talk about the nature of this collective action problem and I'm going to start with uh, just taking the point of departure, the characterization of it that Robert Cohane and Alan Buchanan present, which is uh, a simple rationalist collective action problem. Um, and the way that they characterize it is uh, that it's in the interest of everyone, all members of international society, um, to commit to one of a set of institutions. There are lots of different kinds of institutional arrangements that we could all agree to. Uh, and there's a set that would be advantageous for everybody. Um, any, anything from within that set would be ad advantageous to everybody. Um, but everyone prefers a different option. And what's lacking is a coordination point. We need some kind of reasons that we can all accept as to why we should choose one rather than another. Um, from this set. And if we, if we lack those reasons, uh, we end up um, with inaction, we end up uh, without coordinated action because we can't agree on which of these institutional options to select. If we can't agree on that, we end up without institutional in integration. Um, so that's the, the simple form, that's a, an important um, basic starting point, I think, for understanding the, the, sort of the, the meta-coordination account of, of um, these convergence points that we need as a basis for collective action. Um, to develop. Uh, I want to add to that um, another dimension of this collective action problem, um, the form that it takes within a pluralist institutional order. So I think this um, somewhat stylized char characterization that they make, um, they're obviously thinking of an international society of sovereign states where the, the membership is stable. We know who the participants are who are trying to agree on what an institutional order will be in their sovereign states. Uh, so that the membership, the parties to this agreement, this prospective agreement, are stable, uh, and uh, that's certainly one one kind of setting in which these kinds of these problems arise. Uh, but within the context of a pluralist international order, um, 
I want to suggest that the, the collective action problem is even more complex than that. So when we have not only states, but we have a range of other kinds of institutional forms that political actors can go to to pursue their political objectives. I mean, the economic um, domain, obviously, um, corporations and other forms of economic organisation, uh, a whole you know, range of international institutions that states, individuals, social movements can go to to make cases as to get leverage on uh, political agendas that they may seek to pursue and so on, obviously the sphere of civil society, uh, NGOs and, and organisations of, of a variety of forms uh, that uh, through which capability can be built to pursue agendas uh, and that can provide um, um, institutional mechanisms for, for different groups to coordinate and pursue both collectively. And when you have this kind of institutional pluralism, uh, there's another level to this collective action problem because you don't just have to choose one from a, a pre-given set um, of institutions, but the, the range of options are constantly in flux. Um, it's not even clear who the parties to the agreement need to be because it can be the case within a pluralist order that if you don't like what's on offer at the international level, for example, you can simply opt out and create a regional agreement or you can opt out and try to build an alternative uh, institutional structure uh, within, the, within the sphere of civil society. You can, um, you can attach yourself to some kind of economic actor and try to um, you know, get them to take responsibility for whatever goals of human rights protection or whatever it is you might be trying to pursue. So the collective action problem becomes incredibly complex uh, when the, the order that we're uh, dealing with is a, a pluralist one uh, and when individuals, groups, um, nations, um, economic um, interests have the option of picking and choosing institutions or trying to build new ones uh, when they fail to reach agreement in established forums, uh, then it becomes a very fluid and complex uh, collective action problem indeed. Uh, and this is where I think uh, uh, the theory of political legitimacy comes into its own in trying to come up with a systematic framework for trying to identify uh, convergence points uh, that everyone can agree on as a basis for regulating um, this array of, of institutional actors that uh, contend for support in the form of resources, deference, uh, and attention even, in fact, uh, within the current global order. Uh, and what's required here is some kind of shared values that can be used to say, you know, to, to um, apply standards of legitimacy, that is to say, um, on, under what conditions a given institution is worthy of support. Um, now, Buchanan and Cohane, in, in their work, suggest, uh, they frame the collective action problem in terms of interest, so in terms of the you know, material self-interest um, of each actor, and then propose that the coordination point can be found uh, through shared moral values. So the idea is that, well, we don't all agree on what justice is, but there are, you know, I suppose, thin moralities. There are certain kinds of moral values that everyone does share. This is their argument that everyone does share, uh, and that we can draw on these moral beliefs to set standards of legitimacy for this, for this array of institutions. Um, and the problem with that, of course, is that the points on which we may have moral convergence are often just simply not salient um, to the institutions whose legitimacy we're concerned with. I mean, we might all agree in these sorts of examples in moral use of the universalist arguments that come up, or we all agree, we might not all agree about, um, about justice, but we all agree it's wrong to talk to children, we all agree X, Y, and Z. Uh, the problem is, of course, that a moral agreement that it's wrong to talk to children doesn't really tell us very much about uh, the conditions under which um, a um, financial institution is legitimate or, or worthy of support, or what uh, um, you know, the dispute resolution ought to be you know, at the WTO in order for it to be considered legitimate or whatever. They're very specific questions um, which are tied very much to the functions of the institutions that are at stake when we argue about the legitimacy and try to find um, these standards of acceptability that we can all agree on as a basis for collective action and proceed. And these kinds of minimal moral standards just simply don't seem to be salient in many cases. They're not giving us the the standards that are relevant. Um, so uh, what I'm, I haven't got time to go into this, this is some, a bigger project that I'm working on at the moment is trying to uh, develop a general account of global political legitimacy which can be used to think systematically about how to identify standards for all the diverse range of institutions to provide this convergence point which is a precondition for successful collective action 
that is into, that is to say into institutional integration. And I'll just just say very briefly the essence of the idea that I'm trying to develop, um, which is to say that we can find a convergence point, uh, a, a kind of uh, a way of reasoning that can generate substantive standards for institutions uh, from a normative analysis of the value of collective action itself. So the, the idea here is uh, that there's more than one, because the problem is with the way that the debate is traditionally formulated is this assumption that people have interests and they have moral commitments. And they're the two kinds of salient motivation that exist that can motivate people to commit to, to supporting institutions. Uh, and interests are understood quite narrowly as being concerned with the, the, uh, the pursuit of material self-interest. And morality is understood again quite narrowly as being concerned with a commitment to principles that are based on some kind of impartiality. Obviously, there's different variances, but some form of impartiality between your interests and those of others. Again, these are two very specific um, forms of uh, reasoning and forms of valuation, which are both important. Of course, they play an important role in political life. Um, but they're certainly not exhaustive of the range of forms of, of reasoning, um, of logics of action, you could say, to talk in the language of some sociological literatures, forms of normativity, to talk in the language of some philosophical literatures. Uh, and indeed, it's a theme of some of the recent realist political theory work on legitimacy to talk about the fact that this value of legitimacy is connected to a distinctively political form of normativity, which is not reduced for either to the logic of morality or to the logic of, of um, strategic self-interest. So this is the idea that I'm trying to develop, is to say that what we need in order to identify these convergence points that are a precondition for collective action, uh, we need to think about what the substance of that value is, what this distinctive mode of uh, reasoning is what these shared values are that everyone who recognizes the value in institutional action in principle uh, can commit to that can provide a substantive convergence point. So uh, the idea that I'm developing is that uh, there is a substantive value, you can call it an ethic of institutional life or different ways of formulating it, which is connected to the value of collective action itself. Um, so it's a, it's a value of political impediments that's tied to a, um, a recognition of the value of forms of political empowerment that can come through uh, institutional life. Um, it's ethically distinctive in the sense that it, it is opposed to a kind of ethical traditionalism. So there's a kind of orientation, a kind of understanding of, of what's of value in political life, um, which is required to pursue institutional projects. Uh, which assumes we can do better, you know, which assumes that there is something to be gained, uh, that we can build a, a more worthwhile life through working with others than we can achieve through some kind of um, like continuing to do things the way they've already, already always been done, as in the form of a traditional ethic, for example. Uh, it's also opposed to a kind of atomistic um, liberal ethic, which um, takes as its starting point the assumption that uh, uh, individuals are self-contained in some morally important way and can, um, and that any kind of intrusions on that liberal autonomy is, is, is morally problematic. Um, so it's a distinctive kind of ethic that, that places value on uh, uh, an expansion of capability. So it's getting back to this, the core of the original problem, which is to say uh, a recognition that it is a problem that individuals can't achieve um, all that's of value on their own. Uh, and that uh, you know, a better life can be achieved for individuals, for their communities uh, at, at all different um, scales uh, through collaborative action. And to recognise that there are some substantive back values that actually come along with that recognition. And once we begin to flesh out what those values are, we arrive at, I think, a substantive uh, normative theory of political legitimacy that can provide a convergence point that everyone who is committed in principle to institutional integration, uh, although they may have different interests and different conceptions of justice, um, can commit to these shared values. Uh, so that's the basic idea. There's a, a kind of an instrumental logic to the extent that everyone agrees on a value. There's a strong instrumentalism in the way that you reason in, in designing institutions, so many forms of accountability, uh, many democratic institutions, uh, and 
so on can be justified instrumentally from the point of view of communities that share values. But to the extent that there uh, is disagreement about what the goals of international institutions ought to be, uh, then these, uh, these values, uh, which involve, I think, a range of commitments, substantive commitments to uh, recognising uh, contextual variability. So recognising, for a start, that different institutions have different functional purposes and that whatever standards of legitimacy we want to apply have to uh, take account of um, or have to be accommodating of those functional purposes rather than assuming that um, every institution has to protect human rights or every institution has to be democratic. For some institutions, take a corporation or take any number of institutions that we we'll talk about, uh, there are limits actually on you know, the range of moral values that they can be expected to advance in order for them to discharge their core functions, which are about so. That's the first point. Um, that's where the kind of the instrumentalism comes in. Uh, but then, to the extent that institutions need to also grapple with and provide acceptable solutions in cases where there are disagreements about what their, their functions are and who their memberships ought to be, uh, then I think uh, there are commitments, for example, to uh, revisability. Uh, so the idea that um, this is a where I think you would differ from a traditional aesthetic, uh, the idea that uh, collective action is a valuable thing, I think, often involves a commitment to the fact that, um, or involves a commitment to the recognition um, that no institutional arrangement would be ideal, um, that we can um, often do better, or at the very least, that space needs to be allowed for those who take a different view to push that case and to um, allow some scope for development. So there's a kind of a developmentalism and a provisionalism, I think, that's entailed in this kind of commitment. Uh, and, and, and similarly, I think there has to be a commitment to some kind of um, in principle openness. Um, so particularly in the context of a pluralist order, uh, the idea that, uh, that who are parties to a given um, a collective action commitment, or that is to say who are the participants in a particular institution who has a stake in um, decision making in that institution who should be admitted to a decision making process um, is again something that's in principle open. So there's a kind of orientation towards uh, inclusion, like at least allowing a case to be made and to rights of exit to permit that kind of um, evolution, that, that developmental kind of path. Uh, and there is a lot that could be, could be said about the implications for concrete institutions Five minutes, okay. Uh, I won't be able to say a lot. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of everything, a lot of what I've said is obviously very abstract, and I'm aware of that. Um, but I think the um, the work that this kind of account does can only really be evidenced by working through quite specific um, case study examples of what would follow through applying this kind of um, ethical orientation to particular institutions to try to identify concrete standards um, that everyone can agree. So, provides a criterion for the worthiness of support or the legitimacy of that institution. Uh, just to give a couple of examples um, for illustrative purposes, I can't go into them um, in any depth, for example, something that, uh, I, just to connect up with some of the discussions earlier today, uh, thinking about uh, NGO legitimacy, for example, uh, one of the comments that was made earlier today I think possibly, possibly it was yeah, you. Had that, I'm sure. Um, was this observation about about NGOs uh, often being very focused on their own missions and not? It definitely yeah. wasn't yeah, that comment yet. Yeah. Uh, being very focused on their own missions um, and not engaged with um, broader questions of how their activities might impact on institutional capability elsewhere, on the importance you were talking about in the context of a concern with developing. Um, global governance institutions yeah. specifically, but I think there's a, a broader point here yeah. uh, to be made. Uh, if we reorient ourselves in thinking about NGO legitimacy, for example, uh, from thinking about uh, what have the donors asked the NGO to do, are they accountable to the donors, are they accountable to uh, the beneficiaries of whatever specific action they may be engaged in, whether it's humanitarian um, aid, or whether it's some kind of development assistance or whatever it might be. Uh, currently, a lot of talk about NGO legitimacy, for example, is focused on these very specific um, 
kinds of questions. And there's often, not always, uh, a neglect of the bigger picture questions about the impact that they may have on institutional capability elsewhere. Obviously, there's discussion of this in the context of the impact of NGO activity on state capacity in local contexts. Um, but, I, but I think the, the discussion was had earlier about highlights the fact that uh, uh, there are costs you know, more broadly in the system when we hold particular institutions accountable only within very narrow domains. So this is where I think the point uh, about recognising uh, or, or thinking about collective action as a good in itself and to think about the role that different institutions play in fostering the conditions for that, not only within their own organisation but also elsewhere within the order, um, can point us towards quite specific prescriptions which are um, um, quite concrete and they'll vary across cases. Uh, there's more to be said about states and NGOs and various transnational government structures. I've got some case-based work that I'm doing but don't have time to present um, today. Uh, but I think I'm probably out of time, so I'll leave that. I'm happy to talk more about cases in, in the question time.